How's it going everybody? It's Parallax Abstraction and welcome to Retro Flashback, showcasing gaming's roots for a new generation. So, we're back, and we're back on the Commodore 64, indeed. Uh, I haven't done a video on this platform in a long time, and I, uh, I just love doing it. And, uh, we are also taking a look at a game that, uh, was very popular on the C64 and holds a lot of memory value for me, if you, if you will. And, uh, we're talking about it now because I've been meaning to for a long time, but also because, uh, well, I found something very interesting out the other day that I totally missed regarding this, and, uh, we're gonna talk about that in the next episode, so this is sort of a prelude to that. So yeah, we're taking a look at Bruce Lee. So this came out on a whack of different systems, but we're looking at it on the Commodore 64, which many consider sort of the definitive version and is definitely the uh, version that I remember most fondly from my youth, though I d we did have an Atari 8-bit uh, machine in my house, and that's kind of where I played this, but and which was a fairly faithful reproduction of this. So this is an interesting game because it is very widely regarded and it's actually a pretty fun action platformer despite being a branded title and kind of light on the production values department even as far as c64 games go so this game came out by a company called datasoft which is long since defunct and they were famous for making a bunch of home computer conversions of popular arcade games and for doing a bunch of branded games now when you think about a branded video game in a modern context, you're probably thinking about some kind of really crappy, low quality movie tie-in game. Uh, and what Datasoft did was a little different. <clears throat> they did a couple of things like that, but a lot of what they did was that they took brand, they would buy the rights to a brand or acquire the rights to a brand and just use that as a means to sell pretty much original games. So in, that's the thing in this case. This game is called Bruce Lee, and technically it stars Bruce Lee, the famous martial artist and actor. What does this game have to do with him or anything he's done? Pretty much nothing. Uh, Bruce Lee was basically just the backdrop for this interesting uh, un sort of wholly original plat action platformer game. And... That's basically uh, that's basically what this is. So they use the brand, but but it has really nothing to do with Bruce Lee other than being able to put his likeness and his name on the box. So what's the point of this game? Well, it is an action platformer, and it's got a story as it as it were. I guess uh, you're basically playing as Bruce Lee, trying to infiltrate a wizard's tower and trying to get wealth and the secret of immortality. Apparently, <clears throat> the story it's something that's in the manual, and it literally means nothing. So you've seen a little bit of what this game is about here. So your goal is to traverse these different levels, which have different types of of platforming challenges and get, uh, they vary quite a bit actually, and there's quite a bit of uh, difficulty ramp up in this game. Now, full disclosure, I am playing this game with a cheat mode on that gives me unlimited lives. Not unlimited life, I can die, but I my lives are not limited, and that is uh, actually what makes this game really ch challenging for the most part, is that, is that if you have limited lives on, this game can actually get pretty, pretty, pretty tough later on because when you die, there's no continues. So I died there, but as you can see, my the lives are called falls in this game, which is really weird. That sounds like something that would get like lost in translation from a Japanese game, but this this was developed in in the U.S., which is kind of funny. So yeah, your goal is to get through the levels and to pick up all these little lantern things. Uh, picking up these lanterns not only gives you score, but you you actually have, I believe, I'm not sure if you actually have to pick up every single lantern to finish the game, but they, uh, in certain levels, like here for example, picking up the required lanterns opens the doors which allow you to traverse further. So that's kind of the idea. And you've seen we had those two enemies on the screen there. Now they're not in, no, oh, there he is. Um, there are certain screens where these enemies do not appear, uh, screens that tend to focus a little bit heavier on uh, platforming challenges. So you have that little black ninja and you have the green guy who I believe is, it's either, yeah, it's Yamo is his name. And their goal is simply to, well, wreck your day. There's not a lot of explanation for why they're here. <laughs> But their goal is to basically keep trying to get in your way and to disrupt you and to eventually take you out by doing martial arts stuff on you. Now, the interesting thing about this game is that so the, the Black Ninja is always controlled by the computer. Yamo, uh, when you're playing single player, is controlled by the computer. But uh, if you're playing two player, Yamo can actually be controlled by a the second player. 
And it's interesting because Yamo is supposed to be your opponent uh, in this game. But the second player, if you want, and this is how we used to play it when I was a kid, the second player can choose to actually work with you because Yamo can actually hurt the Black Ninja as well. So if you want, you can uh, choose to attack uh, the Ninja as the second player and actually assist the second player out, which I always thought was really cool. They consider it uh, an opposition game, but it gives you the means to actually play a co-op if you want, which I thought was a really cool little little twist that the game supports that and doesn't stop you from doing it at all. This game technically has a, a separate two-player mode as well, but all that is is an alternating thing. So much like an arcade game, you can have uh, a second player and you alternate. So I die, player two takes over, they have their own score count. And as you can see, this game does have a scoring system and a top score that you can shoot for. The scoring system in this is fine. That's a bit of a relic from the fact that Datasoft did do a lot of arcade ports. It's kind of irrelevant. Uh, your goal in this game is really to get to the end and beat the final boss and sort of uh, finish things up that way. But when you do beat the game, you can play it over again. You can keep going. And that allows you to, uh, you can basically, it's not like a new game plus mode, you're just playing it over again, but it does allow you to get a higher score and keep your score going. So you can technically fight for score that way, which is kind of cool. Uh, but I really like that mechanic of having the secondary enemy uh, that, that uh, the second player can play. And Yamo and the ninja are fairly different in terms of how they, how they play. Um, or how they fight you, I should say. Now, the thing, the only kind of a bummer with this game on that front is that the AI is not particularly bright. Um, I think some of the reasons that there are rooms like this where the AI is not present is simply because any of these little things like this where you're uh, traversing sort of these treadmill type things, they just can't traverse that stuff very well. And I think it was just a, a limitation that they didn't want to program better AI into them. But as well, in rooms like this, it would be kind of a pain in the arse if you were trying to deal with them at the same time. So, this game is actually pretty challenging. It's not looking too bad here. That's I screwed that up. It's partially because I have unlimited lives and partially because I played a lot of this game back in my youth, so I am I beat it many, many times, so I am still still semi decent at it. But what's interesting about this game is that it's it's very well regarded and I still like it a lot, but as you can see the production values in this are pretty pretty weak to be honest with you. There's no music aside from that little sort of Asian inspired ditty in, at the title screen. The sound effects are all very rudimentary. Like the Commodore 64 in particular was capable of a lot more than what this is doing. Uh, it's all kind of sounds that uh, you might hear out of like a you know the PC speaker if you remember old 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 school PC games where all you had was a little sort of beeping speaker if you didn't have a sound card. That's kind of what this sounds like. Uh, everything is extremely pixely. The Commodore 64, as as has been demonstrated before, was capable of much snazzier graphics than this. This is very low rent pixel art. Bruce Lee, I mean, he doesn't really look like anything. You know, he looks like kind of a just a, a weird pixel blob, right? He doesn't. It's it's really not all that impressive. I'm going to show you something here. You've kind of seen it already, but as you can see, there's environmental hazards like that. And the thing I also really like about this game is that. We missed it there, but what's really cool about this game is that it's very, very fair in that the environmental hazards, you kind of saw it there, the environmental hazards are as hazardous to the enemies as they are to you, which is one of the things I really love about this game. So many games, for lack of a better term, cheat, basically making the enemies immune to the same rules that apply to you, right? And I always used to hate that. See, like that. There you go, right there. That's one of the things I always really, really hated about games like that, is it's like, why are you forcing rule conditions on me that you are not imposing on the enemies? And there's various different reasons for that. Some of them are design-related, some of them are uh, programming-related. They basically just didn't want to have the enemies have to deal with that. Um, but in this game, it's completely fair. The enemies can trigger the same traps that you can, and they can be hurt by them. And you can actually use that to your advantage, uh, which is really cool. Because as you've seen as well, the way the enemy spawning works is it's very repetitive. So the Black Ninja will always come back fairly quickly after you kill him. Yamo always spawns later, and at least when he's controlled by the computer. And uh, he will take longer to come back. But they, they come back indefinitely in the screens that they're in. So they're always on your back. But you can sort of manipulate the environment in order to make it possible for them to... So you see I'm back out here, and as you can see, the uh, sort of bull thing there is indicating where I need to go. 
And also, if you are playing this game for score, you, as you can see, hurting these guys and taking them out actually does count a fair bit to your score. I don't know why Yamo's all distorting there when he's coming at me. That's very strange. So, if you actually want to farm score, you can sit here. There's no time limit in this game, so you can sit and just bash on these guys sort of endlessly if you want. And as you can see here, the levels are getting a little bit more complicated uh, as you go along. And yeah, it, it's really interesting. This is a game that, that really lives and dies on its mechanics because, as I said, the production values in this, even by C64 standards, are pretty weak sauce. The graphics aren't very good. The sound's not very good. There's virtually no music. It's, it's pretty low rent, but it doesn't matter because the mechanics of this game are, are so good. The level design is varied and interesting. The enemies are really cool and actually challenging in their own very unique ways. The way they integrated two players is really cool. And yeah, the, the fact that the enemies can actually hurt themselves on environmental hazards is extremely uncommon uh, in for this type of game. This is really something that was unheard of. And in those various different ways, it, it really makes this title stand out from a lot of similar ones of its era. And I think that's why it was so widely regarded and is still fairly revered. Uh, it's definitely what I remember about it. And I just remember stuff like if you use like things like that little sort of that sort of thing that Yamo does, you could actually just trigger that whenever you wanted if you were playing as the second player. Like it, it serves no purpose. Like we actually thought when we were kids that maybe it did something. Uh, that, that maybe they did something like, for example, he you know it would heal him or it would make him more powerful or something. And we were trying to figure out what that meant. Nope, doesn't mean a thing. It's just it's just a thing he does. And when you're playing as a second player, you can just trigger it whenever you want. And we, we just thought it was hilarious. And little things like that, I think, are really, really cool. Uh, I really enjoyed how they how they approached that. And I thought it was, uh, I thought it was really interesting. Just little touches like that that really made this game stand out a lot. So we're actually pretty far into it here. So this game is actually, I think I said this before, this game is actually very short. So you know what? You may actually just see me finish it here. It's very short, but don't let that dissuade you. This game is actually, as I said, this game is actually really, really tough if you're you're playing with uh, limited lives, which I am not. If you're not cheating your way through this game, it's, uh, it's actually pretty difficult. It took me... Many, many tries and many, many hours when I played this as a kid to be able to beat it uh, legit, if you will. Uh, this version that I'm playing uh, has a trainer in it that allows you to both have unlimited lives and you can also turn off what they call sprite collisions, uh, which I have not done. What sprite collisions uh, basically means is that uh, the enemies don't affect each other when they go through them. So the enemies can't actually hurt me, uh, but I actually can't hurt them. That's why they don't call it invulnerability. Because while you are invulnerable, you're you can't uh, you can't hurt the enemies either. So it actually turning off sprite collisions actually puts you at a disadvantage from a gameplay perspective. Um, so where this game is also a little bit of a letdown, and I'm going to show you that here is in the final boss. The final boss is a very very simple platforming challenge, and that's kind of it. He's impressive looking. But it, if you know what you're doing, I, I, the thing is, it's kind of cheap and and sort of surprises you, which is I, the whole point of it. You, you can kind of get yourself uh, screwed very quickly if you don't know how to approach him. But if you do, he's actually pretty, he, he's dead easy, actually, which is a bit of a bummer. In a platforming game like this, a, a really good sort of climactic final boss fight would have been really cool, you know, and that's not what you get here at all. Um, which is a bit too bad, but like I said, this is not the easiest game in the world. It actually is pr fairly challenging, and uh, especially if you're playing with a second player who is playing in opposition. If you're playing with a second player and want to get that player to play Yamo the way it's supposed to be, which is in opposition to you, this can actually be really tough because... When you have the AI, uh, when you don't have the AI controlling it and have a human player controlling it, because the AI in this game is kind of dumb. If you have a human controlling it, this can actually get really tough because Yamo can can really kind of wreck your day if uh, he's controlled by a, a player with some skill. So I want to say that's almost the best way to play this game. I'm wondering if that's really how they intended it to be. Uh, was that this? You know, they ha obviously had to make this game single player friendly, but I do wonder if they intentionally really designed it to be uh, sort of ideally played with two people. Um, oh, and it looks like the game actually. Oh, okay. I thought the game froze up there, but it it just sort of 
had to figure it figure its stuff out there a little bit. That was weird. And you see here, like, even when I'm playing against the computer here, it's being annoying because it's really inhibiting me from getting up this ladder. Really, I've got to take him out if I want to do that. Because Yamo, as you can see, when he does this sort of jump attack, has a higher uh, plane that he can go at, which can really screw you up. All right, we're chewing through this pretty quick here. This is rather a tough, this is a rather tough platforming section, but yeah, this is a game that's sort of greater than the sum of its parts, I guess, is maybe the way to put it, is the fact that it's, that's what I like about it. Like, look how hilarious Bruce Lee looks when he's ducking there, like, it's just, it's, it's kind of janky. But this is a game that, that, it, that's what I like about it, is that it, it's really fun and really good, despite the fact that, by all intents and purposes, this, this game almost feels like it should have been shovelware and that sounds like a backhanded compliment and maybe it is but it is nonetheless a compliment is that this is a game that came out by a company that was usually famous for quick and dirty arcade ports and branded content but they often did do some cool branded content and it, it just doesn't it has production values that indicate to me that this game did not have a big budget or a lot of development time but this is one of those really cool, unique gems where, in spite of those things, they came up with something special. This is one of those games that really demonstrates that graphics don't make a game. You know, graphics don't make a good game because the graphics in this, you can find way better looking and sounding games than this on the Commodore 64. And yet this game is very fondly revered because it just looks... So here's the boss. So see those things he's shooting at me? Yeah, those are the things that surprise you. So... As you can see, if you don't move real quick, you kind of get boned. But all you got to do is this. Run. That's all you got to do is run to the end. And that's it. He did. Congratulations. Hello. I'm in this horrible looking fire room, but it's all good. I'm not doing that. The game's doing that. So you sit here, you get to look at this neat screen for a little bit, and then you basically loop around and you get to do it all again. And you get to keep doing that and farming top score until you run out of lives, which I never will. So, in this case, so, you know, that's a bit of a thing. But you've seen the whole thing. And But like I said, this game is, is actually really cool and it's really tough uh, if you play it legit, which you should. Uh, and... It's really interesting. It's a branded game that clearly didn't have much of a budget or much production value, and yet they really came up with something cool. And it's a lot of fun. And it's just, the, it's mechanically weird and different, and that's what I really like about it. There's a, a bunch of components here that seem odd and almost nonsensical taken on their own, and they really kind of are. But the way they coalesce makes something really different just cool and not the kind of thing I've really seen. I've never seen a game really like this elsewhere. Uh, not that play that that plays like this and that just isn't this combination of weird components that add up into something neat. It's just a weird type of uh, event, I guess, in gaming history. Something that that by all rights maybe shouldn't have been that good and ended up being really good and memorable in spite of that. And I think I really like that. Games like this are the ones that I, I, I really enjoy. And they're often the ones that are memorable because you go, man, why was this good? I don't know, but it really was. And that's Bruce Lee for sure. Uh, so I, I still like it quite a bit. I'm glad I got a chance to play this again. This game did come out on just about everything with a screen back in its time. This came out on the Atari 8-bit family, the MSX, the ZX Spectrum, uh, the Amstrad CPC, the BBC Micro. This is the C64, obviously. The Apple II, the PC-88, MS-DOS. Uh, it, 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 was, it was in a lot of places. Um, I personally think this version is the best. The Atari 8-bit version, um, which is what I played a lot of, was also really good, but it was basically exactly like this, because because it was a fairly low production value game, it was probably pretty easy to do conversions of it to a lot of other systems, which is maybe one of the reasons it was done this way. Um, it does seem the AI is harder on this second playthrough, but maybe I may just be wrong about that. You do see that everybody's spawning quicker. So actually, I said that the second playthrough was no different than the first, but actually, I think it is because, yeah, the enemies are spawning much more quickly and they seem a lot more aggressive. A lot more aggressive, actually. Yamo in particular is being kind of a dick. 
And they, I think they might have more health, too. I, I think it's taking more hits to take them out. So there you go. I, I learned something today. Because I, I never finished a second run of this game when I was a kid. I, I only beat it. Uh, I would beat it the one time, and then and then I never got, got further than that. So there you have it. But yeah, this is a really cool game. Um, I think it's it's a it's a good piece of, of gaming history, and it's one of those games that sh really shows what happens when uh, weird parts coalesce into something cool, and you get something that that maybe wasn't didn't have any right to be as good as it was. And uh, I I think it's pretty neat. And uh, this leads into something cool that we're going to talk about next time. On the next episode, we're going to be doing actually a retro flash forward of Bruce Lee 2. Yeah, seriously. This game actually never got an official sequel. But someone who loved this game, obviously even more than I did, um, an independent developer, did a an unofficial sequel to this game in the same kind of style in 2013, actually. Uh, and it's freely available. Uh, and I, I missed this back in the day. I don't know how. I only found out about it recently. But we're going to talk about that, and I'm going to show you that, because I think he did a very faithful modernization of a lot of, uh, a lot of what was in this game. And, uh, I think it's going to be really fun to talk about. So, check back for that. That'll be in the next episode. And yeah, that is Bruce Lee, developed and published by Datasoft in 1983 for... Well, this is the Commodore 64 version, but as I said, it came out in a billion other places. Really cool game, really cool relic of the 8-bit era, and uh, something a little bit special in many different ways, I think. It's uh, it's a good time. I, I really, really like it. My name is Parallax Abstraction. Thank you all very much for watching. If you liked what you saw, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. It does help me out a great deal. And I'll see you guys with Bruce Lee too next time. Take it easy, everybody.